we're all seeking alpha here. So, uh, Dan Shainer, I thought I would start with you and ask if you could give us some real-world examples of how at Chimera you've used alternative data to improve the investment process. Okay, Tim. Thank you. Good question. And I'm happy to give you a couple of examples with uh, the caveat that, of course, what you're about to hear is a very, very small sample of uh, what we think alternative data can do based on exclusively our own experience. Um, we do primarily two things with alternative data, and I would categorize them as uh, now casting and projecting the future. Now casting is basically as simple as figuring out, hey, what happened last quarter? And projecting the future is trying to project something hopefully important and useful, you know, a few quarters or years into the future. Uh, so let's talk about now casting uh, briefly. Um, I would say, I don't know if you guys would agree with me or not, but uh, as recently as five years ago, if you just had access to credit card data, which I'm sure m many of you are familiar with, and certainly somebody from Majestic would be very familiar with, um, you had an edge just because it hadn't been uh, fully distributed to the rest of the market that does consumer and retail. Uh, but over the past five years, as credit card data has become a lot more uh, distributed, um, gaining a now casting edge based on it alone has become really tough. So where we've started to move and where I think the market's moving is to start building ensembles based on multiple data sets that are independent of each other but track more or less the same thing. Um, the chief benefit of building ensembles from independent data sources is that the ensemble that you come up with ultimately, if you do it right, is more precise and frequently more robust than just any of the data sources individually. And that creates multiple opportunities, uh, including spotting situations where one of the more popular data sets is going to be wrong this time. And if that's the thing that most of the market uses to imply consensus, well, that becomes a really wonderful opportunity. And it's just one example of uh, sort of you know, something creative you can do with alternative data. Uh, if you were to start looking at uh, something a little bit more fundamental and projecting the future, alternative data gives us and, and others a, a suite of tools that are uh, really powerful for projecting the future. And two of our favorites are uh, cohort analysis and cross-shopping analysis. I'll just give you brief examples of the two. Uh, from, from COVID during this past cycle, um, cohort analysis, i.e. figuring out what's happening with tranches of, uh, of consumers in real time, we were able to find a wholesale uh, membership club where the new customers they acquired were going to be very sticky and um, stick around for a long time post-COVID. That became a good long. Flip side, a furniture retailer that uh, sold uh, e-commerce furniture, consuming empty calories while new customers they acquired weren't going to stick around for a long time, became a great short. Uh, and then briefly, so I don't take too much time, uh, cross-shopping analysis. I think one of the best trades we've ever done was discovering a situation where a uh, e-commerce retailer that sold pet food entered the pet pharmacy space, and we were able to use the analysis of where particular customers from the incumbents were shopping in real time to discover that this new entrant was going to dis basically disintermediate the entire space. All the customers from the incumbents went to the new uh, entrant, and we were able to see in real time that they weren't coming back. Uh, so I, I would say that uh, alternative data can help you with both things, now casting and if used creatively also longer-term projections. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Um, Mike, Dan was talking a lot there about uh, the, the research that, that alternative data is used for. From, from your perspective, are there questions that you previously thought couldn't be answered by data that now can be? Yeah, actually quite a lot. So, <clears throat> you know, let's, uh, so when we talk about alternative data, let's define what they are, right? So, you know, I kind of define it quite, quite broadly. Uh, I consider alternative data pretty much anything that's not traditional financial statement based, right? you know, income statement or balance sheet. So, so you're talking about textual information, you're talking about, you know, credit cards, satellites, and, um, you know, biographical database, you know, peop, you know, whatever supply, you know, graphs and so on, right? So there's a lot. So, I mean, I think three main things off the top of my head. One is the, uh, the value of intangibles, right? So um, how, do you, how do you value, the, how, do you, how do you assess the value of a brand, the value of a patent portfolio, um, you know, that can all more, you know, can be better answered with uh, alternative data, right? Second thing is sentiment. Are people in, in a company or, or, you know, is the company being viewed positively by its various stakeholders? I think that's, uh, that's something that, you know, alternative data can answer better than traditional data sets. And finally, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, Dan mentioned the noun casting and, and for, you know, forward-looking, right? Forward-looking projections. I think the traditional financial statement-based uh, information are quite limited in that regard. So, so using alternative data, you can get some insights into those aspects. 